Patricia, Amina, and Sarah drove back to Louisville and once they got there, Patricia told them that she was going back to Yasser and that they were coming with her. Amina panicked and she texted Joseph telling him, Jojo, mom tricked us, she went back, I'm so scared. Hey everyone, welcome back to What Happened with Jackie Flores. I'm Jackie and I'm super, super excited that you guys are listening to my brand new podcast. I've been listening to the feedback you guys have been giving me about my podcast and I heard your requests. The majority of you guys wanted the video versions to be on my channel so we were able to make it work and from now on, all video versions will be on my YouTube channel, Jackie Flores. I'm so excited about having the videos on my channel but if you still wanna listen to the audio version, you can listen to me on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and anywhere else where you get your podcast. Also, I have my friend Anya here, so if you hear her jumping in and asking questions or making comments, it's because this is her first time ever hearing about this case. Today, we're going to be talking about what happened to sisters Amina and Sarah Saeed. What makes this case so upsetting is that Amina and Sarah were killed by a family member, someone you'd think would be the last person to harm you, someone that was supposed to take care of them, love them, and protect them. There is so much information to go over, so let's jump right in and talk about what happened to Amina and Sarah Saeed. Amina was born on March 3, 1989 in Dallas, Texas, and her sister Sarah was born on March 16, 1990, also in Dallas, Texas. They were born to their parents, Patricia Owens and Yasser Saeed. So let's talk a little bit about Patricia and Yasser. There was a very big age gap between the two. Patricia was 14 years old and Yasser was 29 years old when they started dating. I know, it's crazy. They actually only dated for about three weeks before deciding to get married in February of 1987. Three weeks? That seems insanely fast. No, yeah, it was insanely fast. And you might be wondering, how can a 15-year-old get married to a 29-year-old? Like, how is that even legal? Well, Yasser was able to convince Patricia's dad to allow the marriage to happen because he claimed that he was a very wealthy man. So Patricia's dad actually signed the marriage certificate for her since people underage need a parent's signature. Yasser was born in Sinai, Egypt, and he came to the United States on a student visa in 1983. So he claimed that he came from money and as for Patricia's family, they were poor, so Yasser promised that he would take care of Patricia if they got married. So because of that, Patricia's family agreed and they allowed her to marry Yasser at 15 years old. However, it turns out that he was not rich, he did not come from a wealthy family. In fact, he actually was a taxi driver, which there's nothing wrong with that, but he lied. He lied about his status, he lied about his wealth, and he used that lie to manipulate Patricia's family into letting her get married at such a young age. So as soon as they got married, Patricia had to step in and she got a job working minimum wage since she was a high school dropout. About a year into their marriage, Patricia and Yasser had a son named Islam, and then soon after, they had a Amina and Sarah. So in total, there were three children that came from Patricia and Yasser. However, he did have another daughter who was born in 1987 with a different woman. So the girls in Islam did have a half sister, but we don't really know much about this sister. Now, going back to the girls, Amina had many hobbies and participated in a lot of after school activities, including cheer and taekwondo. She was very beautiful and she had these gorgeous, captivating green eyes. Sarah was just as beautiful. She was sweet and just full of so much joy. You can tell that Amina and Sarah were obviously very close friends and not just sisters. They were basically best friends. They even had a similar idea for what their future would look like. Both girls dreamed of getting an education and becoming doctors someday. During their teenage years, Amina, Sarah, and Islam got part-time jobs so they could have their own money and independence, not because they needed to get a job to support the family financially. Sarah and Amina worked at a general store and Islam worked at Walmart. Now the family was half Christian, half Muslim, but they weren't actually super Super religious on either side. Yasser was considered more of a semi-practicing Muslim. For example, Yasser and Patricia got married in a Christian church instead of having a traditional Muslim wedding. So it seemed like Yasser wasn't super traditional, or at first he wasn't. What about the girls? Did they follow the religion? Well, neither Patricia or her daughters ever wore hijabs. In fact, Amina wasn't religious at all. The way the Muslim religion was presented to her didn't make her want to be a part of it. Now, I just want to make it clear that this is Amina's truth about her own experiences, and this information is coming from conversations with her friends, where she goes more in depth about some of the practices in her culture that she didn't agree with. For example, Amina said to a friend, Muslim men beat their wives. Obviously, this isn't a blanket truth, but maybe this is something she witnessed herself. 
So let's talk about what happened to Amina and Sarah. On January 1st, 2008, things were not good in the Saeed household. There were a lot of disagreements between Amina, Sarah, and with their father. At this time, Amina actually ran away from home because she couldn't take the fighting any longer, and she was currently staying with a friend named Edgar. Patricia wanted Amina to come home and be with the family again, so she went to the friend's house and she convinced Amina to leave with her. She told her that her father wasn't mad at her anymore and that all was forgiven. After a lot of convincing, Amina went with her mother. Now that everyone was back at the house, Yasser told Amina and Sarah that he wanted to take them out to eat so they could talk things out. The three got inside the taxi, Amina got in the passenger seat, Sarah sat in the back while Yasser drove. They left the home together and then at around 7.30 p.m., 911 received a phone call from 17-year-old Sarah. Police answer the call and the first thing they hear is Sarah saying, help, my dad shot me, I'm dying. The dispatcher asked her, what's going on ma'am and you can hear that sarah is so distressed on this call and she just replies to him i'm dying that's what's up at some point 911 dispatcher can also hear sarah pleading for her father to stop killing her she said oh my god not again it's not over stop it no what's going on ma'am i'm dying that's what's up oh my god are you still there ma'am Ma'am, what is your address? Ma'am. You can literally hear Sarah take her last breath while on this call. It's just so upsetting. Can you imagine seeing your father do this to you and to your sister? The last memory that these two young girls had is of their father shooting at them and trying to end their life. After Sarah stops responding to the 911 dispatcher, police start to trace her phone number to see who she is, where she's at, and you know, to try to get help to her. That's when they discovered that this number led back to Islam, Sarah and Amina's older brother. Now the reason it traced back to Islam is because he had given Sarah his cell phone before she left, so she didn't call off her own cell phone. Phone. Now that they knew whose phone this belonged to, they were working on tracking down her location. But as they were doing this, police received another 911 call from a bystander who had come across Sarah and Amina's bodies. This is that 911 call. The cab in our cab stand doesn't appear that there's a driver, um, but there are two people inside the cab, one in the uh, passenger seat and one in the rear of the vehicle. Uh, one of the people in the, in the passenger seat looks like she's hunched over. And okay. she has blood coming from her ear. It doesn't look like they're alive to me. I understand that. We've got our officers in route. When police arrived at the scene, 17-year-old Sarah and 18-year-old Amina's bodies were still in Yasser's taxi, which was parked at a taxi stand at the Omni Mandalay Hotel. Now, the manager at this hotel says that he walked outside and he saw the taxi there with Sarah and Amina inside. He said that as soon as he saw the taxi, he knew that something was wrong. He didn't even want to open the door. He didn't want to touch the door. Nothing. He said it looked like the two girls weren't alive. Both the hotel manager and the police officer that arrived at the scene say that to this day, they're traumatized by what they saw. I was watching the police officer's testimony about this and he broke down. It was emotional for him to remember what he encountered that day. So Yasser committed this horrible crime and murdered his own children in a public place and then left them in the back of his own taxi and just ran away. Yep, that's exactly what he did. He shot Amina two times in the chest and then he shot Sarah nine times. It's shocking how Sarah still had the energy and the strength to call 911 and she literally used her last breath to identify the killer as her own father. She wanted to make sure that he would not get away with this. Cops immediately began searching the area for any type of evidence and that's when they found the girl's passport, Patricia's passport, and Yasser's passport. Then they started looking for Yasser himself and they realized that he was nowhere to be found. Found. They searched the family home, they searched his work, they searched anywhere he possibly could be, but he was gone. It was as if he had just vanished into thin air. Now, as police continue to look for the girl's father, their killer, it was also time to inform the family of what had happened. One of the girl's closest friends says that when she found out, she could not believe it. She was shocked to learn that her friends had been murdered by their father. The entire community was in shock. I mean, how is it possible that a father killed his own two children? And just left them sitting in a cab as if they were nothing and now this man was on the run and he was hiding from what he had done so it was just very shocking to everyone
Now, going back to the investigation, as soon as news outlets heard about what happened to Amina and Sarah, a lot of them started referring to their murders as an honor killing. Now, an honor killing is when a girl or a woman has dishonored her family, and the only way to cleanse that shame is by killing her. Honor killings are most common in the Middle East and South Asia, and they aren't something that is tied to Muslim religion. They're defined as something tied to a culture, not to any religion. Now, to me, an honor killing sounds like someone being murdered because of misogyny and not something to do with honor. But either way, murder is murder. So whether Yasser considered what he did as an honor killing or not doesn't really matter at the end of the day. He had no right to take the lives of these two young girls, the lives of his daughters. Okay, so let's backtrack a little bit and let's talk about what led up to this moment. There's just so much information to unpack, so let's go to the beginning with Patricia and Yasser's marriage. As I mentioned at the start, Patricia and Yasser got married when Patricia was 15 years old and when Yasser was 29. He told her family that he was wealthy, that he was going to take care of her, but that was a lie. That was simply a ruse he used to allow the parents to let Patricia marry him. Patricia says that her and Yasser's marriage was you know, going fine for about six to seven months. However, when they approached the one year mark, things really started to go downhill. According to Patricia, he regretted marrying an American and he started to become physically abusive. He would wake her up when he came home from work by kicking the bottom of her feet or by hitting her. He would throw clothes out of the dresser and make Patricia clean it up. And one time he even cut Patricia's leg with a knife because she wouldn't have sex with him. Yasser would also ask teenage Patricia to pose in photos where he would hold a knife to her throat. That's horrifying. Did any of this abuse ever get reported? Well, over the course of their marriage, she had caught Yasser having six different affairs, and those were just the ones that she had found out about. It was also discovered in the investigation that Amina had sent emails to her friends saying that her dad kicked her in the stomach and in the face with boots, and he told her, sit up, whore. Also, just diving deep into the family's past, when Amina and Sarah were eight and nine, they told their maternal grandmother that Yasser was sexually abusing them and that he had been doing that for two to three years. The grandmother, of course, told Patricia, and as soon as she found out, she moved out of the house. She called the police and told them about what had happened. Police went to go speak to Amina and Sarah, and that's when they told them that their father had been sexually and physically abusing them. In Amina's testimony to police, she told them that her dad put his front part in her front part. But then the girls apparently recanted what they said and all the charges were dropped. Clearly, Yasser must have manipulated them to recant their statements. Their Aunt Jill also feels this way and she said that Amina told her that her parents forced the two girls to say that they had made the entire thing up. I just don't understand how cases like this aren't looked into more. Like, why would police believe their recant more than their original statement? So after this, Patricia and Yasser got back together. She and the girls moved back into the family home and they were all living together as if none of this had happened. And this actually caused Patricia and her mother to become estranged because of the rest of the family still believed Amina and Sarah's accusation. It's really sad because I do feel sorry for Patricia. I'm sure she was stuck in a horrible situation and abusive relationships are so hard to get out of. So I understand in a way why she went back to Yasser, but it just breaks my heart that Amina and Sarah weren't protected by their mother in that sense. They came out, they spoke their truth about how their father was abusing them, and instead of going somewhere safe, they were sent right back to the house to live with him. So they just went back to living a normal life, like nothing happened. Mm -hmm. Yep, that's basically what happened. The girls never reported Yasser again for sexual abuse, but there are home videos that Yasser filmed of the girls in their bedroom, and he makes these weird and, you know, vaguely sexual comments about them. In one video, Amina is sitting on the ground, she's covering herself with a blanket, and she's telling her dad that this is illegal and that he needs to get out of her room. Then he starts recording the girls once they're on their bed, and he's like zooming in on their feet and on their legs. Both girls keep telling him to stop doing this to stop videotaping them. He even zooms in on one of the girl's legs and says, nice legs. I just feel like that's such a weird thing to say to your children. He then tells the girl's brother to remove Sarah's blanket. The brother goes to do this and obviously Sarah tries to resist and he ends up removing the blanket and that's when you can see Yasser zooming in on Sarah's butt. This is his own daughter and he's doing this on camera. Both girls are clearly uncomfortable in the video and they tell Yasser that they're going to delete this footage and they beg him to leave them alone. There's actually a couple of videos that are online. You can find them on YouTube that Yasser filmed of the girls and it just makes you feel so uncomfortable when you watch it. Get out! I'm erasing this tape! 
No, you can't. Yes, I will. Uh, Are you drunk? This is illegal. Do I have to tip you and you're sleeping? Even just the audio of that is just so creepy. According to friends and family, Yasser would follow the girls around and he would record them. Both girls had jobs and there's this video of Sarah at her job and Yasser is recording her from far away watching her every movement. You can hear Yasser say, she smiled at a customer. Now Amina is in the car with him and she seems annoyed at the fact that they're even doing this. She tells him, well, she has to do it. It's part of her customer service job, like it's normal. And Yasser replies and says, she's in trouble. So by the time the girls were teenagers, Yasser was trying to set up arranged marriages for them with men from Egypt. When Amina was 16 years old, Yasser actually took her to Egypt and he tried to have her married off to a man in his 40s who was a friend of Yasser's. Amina, of course, refused this marriage and luckily it didn't happen. He had told people about his plans to have both Amina and Sarah married after they graduated from high school. He also said his plan was to marry them to the highest bidder. Okay, wait, what, what does that mean? Yeah, so basically an arranged marriage is something that happens in a certain cultures that can range from two people getting married who have never met to two people getting married who have only met a few times, but there's typically someone who is setting these two people up. So in an arranged marriage in Egypt, or at least in this case, if either of the girls were in an arranged marriage, they would get a sizable mar, which is a traditional dowry. Basically, it's money the parents would get for the marriage. However, the other family also has to provide something and y'all Yasser had purchased a small vacation chalet by the sea in Sinai to be a wedding gift for Amina. He also planned to buy the property next to it for Sarah and for her future husband. Okay, but I'm sure they wanted to pick their own husbands. Yeah, they did. And on top of Amina wanting to go to college to become a doctor, Yasser also told her that if she wanted to go to get her education, it would only be if her husband allowed it. So Yasser had become even more controlling over the girls and their dating lives, mainly obsessing over trying to find out if they were talking to boys or dating anyone. He was always at home monitoring them. And when he wasn't, he would make sure that their brother Islam was. Allegedly, Yasser would go through their computer, but that wasn't even the worst of it. He gave Amina a car to drive to all of her lessons, and he swapped out the driver's airbag with an audio recorder. From doing this, he learned that Amina had a boyfriend, and he hit and kicked her in the face, which cut her lips on her braces. When Yasser got phone bills, he would call all of the phone numbers the girls' phones had communicated with to find out if they were talking to any boys. Now, Amina and the boyfriend that Yasser found out about through the car ended their relationship. But after that, she got into a new relationship with a secret boyfriend named Joseph Moreno. They met while Amina was taking Taekwondo classes and the two of them quickly hit it off. Joseph was saved in Amina's phone under a fake name and they would talk in code. Amina also had a second secret phone paid for by Joseph that Yasser did not know about so that she could contact him more easily. Amina and Joseph would also pass love letters and notes to each other while they were together in person. It's just really sad how Amina and Joseph had to go to all these lengths to hide their relationship. They had to get a secret phone to talk to each other with. I mean, they had to put him down with a fake name. She was so controlled at home that she had to be so secretive when it came to love. Amina showed Joseph's mother, Ruth, a photo of all her family members, and she warned Ruth that if she ever saw any of these people around her house or around Ruth and Joseph when they were out in public, to be very scared and to go to the police. Amina and Joseph even talked about getting married one day and they they planned on eloping because they were so in love, but also so that she could escape her father. She also confessed to Joseph that her dad had sex with her and with her sister Sarah, but that it had ended years ago. Eventually, Yasser found one of Amina and Joseph's love letters and he became enraged. Amina tried to tell him that it was just a made-up note to a fake boyfriend, but he didn't believe her. He started beating Amina, demanding she tell him where Joseph was, but Amina wouldn't say. Yasser was determined to keep Amina and Joseph apart, so he immediately packed up the family and he moved them all from Bedford to Louisville, which is about 20 miles away. After this, Amina truly believed that her father planned on killing her. In an email, she said that she had plans to use her father's gun to kill herself to make it easier for him. Amina also sent a letter to Ruth saying, I hate it here, I love Jojo, and I pray we'll be together again. 
She also sent Joseph a love letter saying, I don't care, he'll have to kill me first. I'd rather die than live without you. Now it turns out that Sarah also had a secret boyfriend which Islam told Yasser about. Yasser also threatened to kill her. On December 24th, 2007, Amina once again refused her dad's proposal for an arranged marriage. Yasser pulled a gun on Amina and he put it to her head, threatening to kill her. Amina and Sarah knew that they had to run away for the safety of their lives, so they left their mom Patricia on Christmas Day. They took their SIM cards out of their phones and they threw them away. Then they went to Tulsa, Oklahoma and they leased an apartment. Okay, wow. So they had all made an effort to actually leave Yasser before their murders. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they did leave before the murders and Yasser reported them as all missing and Patricia had to call an officer to inform them that they were all alive and well, but that they left because they feared for their safety. And the police didn't follow up on that? I guess not. So using a new SIM card, Amina called Joseph and they decided to continue dating despite everything that had happened. Yasser contacted Patricia's family to try and find them, but the family wouldn't tell them where they were. And they told Patricia to not go back. But unfortunately, that's not what happened. Patricia ended up calling Yasser and now that he had her new phone number, he was constantly calling her and leaving her voicemails, telling her to come home with the family. And that's what Patricia decided to do. On December 31st was the anniversary of her mother's passing and she wanted to go put flowers on her grave. So she decided to go back with Amina and Sarah and spend New Year's in Texas. Joseph told Amina not to go back, but she said she had to do what she had to do. Patricia assured the girls that they would not be staying at the house with Yasser, but that was actually a lie. Patricia, Amina, and Sarah drove back to Louisville, and once they got there, Patricia told them that she was going back to Yasser and that they were coming with her. Amina panicked, and she texted Joseph telling him, Jojo, mom tricked us. She went back. I'm so scared. So even though Sarah went back, Amina refused, and she said that she would rather die than go back to Yasser. She stayed at a friend's house, and Yasser begged for her to at least meet with him so they could work it out. And as we know, on January 1st, Patricia went. She got Amina. She brought her back to the family home. Patricia says that Amina said she was hungry, so that's when Yasser said that he would take the girls to a nearby Denny's. He left the house with the two girls, and he left Patricia and her son Islam behind. And, well, after that, we know what happened. So the girls' reasons for running away were completely valid, because mm -hmm. their father was fully intending to hurt them or murder them. Yes, Amina 100% believed that her father was going to kill her. So some people, including Patricia's own family, believe that she knowingly brought the girls back into harm. Patricia claims that she never thought Yasser would kill them and recently after the murders, she was quoted saying, Yasser is a good man. And it's reported that she even bragged to people about the money that she and Yasser would get for the arranged marriages. So after the murders of her daughter, Patricia briefly lived with her son Islam, but eventually she got her own apartment and she believed that Islam flew to Egypt. But Patricia would be considered a victim of Yasser's too. You know, he was physically abusive towards her and he would often threaten her. On average, it takes people seven attempts to leave an abusive relationship before they're actually able to do it. So that might have been why Patricia went back and why she wanted her daughters to go back. Patricia was never arrested or charged for any crime in connection to her daughter's murders. But still, a lot of people believe that Patricia should be charged for her compliance in all of this and that at the very least, she witnessed her daughters being abused and didn't help them. Yeah, I don't understand how CPS or the police were never called. No, same. I don't understand either, and it just seemed like a lot of people failed Amina and Sarah. Their extended family could have even tried to do more. Their friends could have told a teacher. I mean, guys, I just really want to stress, if someone tells you that they're being abused, please take it seriously and tell someone who can help. Now let's talk about where Yasser went after the murders. People assume that he must have immediately escaped to Egypt or that he might be hiding out at Amina's chalet, but there was never any proof of that. People had called into tip lines that they thought they saw Yasser driving a taxi in New York City and in Newark, New Jersey, and the FBI released a statement that he could be in that area and for people to be on the lookout. But even with a $100,000 reward, those leads never went anywhere. But then on August 14th, 2017, 
2017, a maintenance worker who worked at an apartment complex Islam lived in in Bedford, Texas, reported that he saw a man who matched Yasser's description inside Islam's apartment. Detectives then showed the maintenance worker a photo of Yasser and he confirmed that it was him. So at 6.30 p.m. that same night, an FBI agent went to Islam's apartment to interview him. Islam allegedly refused to cooperate and he called someone saying, we have a problem, which I guess was overheard by the FBI. By 1 a.m., the FBI had a search warrant for Islam's apartment, which was empty when they arrived. But the sliding glass door to the patio was open, and below it was a bush that had broken branches, meaning that someone had most likely jumped onto it. Also by the bush was a pair of glasses, which were taken into evidence. Along with that, police also collected cigarette butts and a toothbrush. A lab determined that the DNA on those objects most likely came from Yasser. But then after that, the case went cold again. I know I haven't really spoken much about Islam because there's not much about him or what he did after all of this, but I just find it crazy that his dad murdered his two sisters and not once did he ever do any interviews talking about what happened to them. He never spoke out about it or how he wanted his father to get caught nothing. And it just makes you wonder, you know, was he actually hiding Yasser in his apartment? Wait, so the case went cold again after this? Like, you kind of have mm -hmm. to Like, how did they not find him at that point? I have no idea. They didn't get any leads again until August of 2020 when police started a 24-hour surveillance of a home in Justin, Texas. During the surveillance, they saw Islam and Yasser's brother, Yasin, coming and going from the home. But they would also see a shadow of someone else inside the house after Islam and Yasin were gone. After just a week of surveilling the house, the FBI was able to get a search warrant and on August 26, 2020, 12 years later, just 27 miles away from where Amina and Sarah were murdered, Yasser was finally arrested. They found him in what appeared to be a hidden room with a cot in the back of the home's converted garage. It's crazy to me that Yasser was able to stay hidden so close to where the murders happened for 12 years. And for six years during that time, he was literally on the FBI's 10 most wanted fugitives list and no one had found him until now. So on the same day Yasser was arrested, Islam, who was then 32 years old, and Yasin, Yasser's brother, were arrested near Eulis, Texas, and they were both charged with concealing a person from arrest. Honestly, the fact that Islam would help his dad hide for years after he murdered his sisters is just so disturbing and shocking to me. It's also believed that many other people helped Yasser hide, and a federal criminal complaint was made that said that Islam was in contact with two or more of Yasser's brothers. So let's get into the trials. Islam's trial was the first to happen on January 19th, 2021, and he actually pleaded guilty to harboring a fugitive, conspiring to harbor a fugitive, and one count of conspiracy to obstruct justice. The U.S. attorney at the time made a statement saying that Islam prioritized the whims of his father, an alleged killer, over justice for his own sisters. On April 27, 2021, Islam was sentenced to 10 years in federal prison for his crimes. Yasin's trial happened at the end of January 2021, and his defense said that Yasin hated Yasser for what he did to Amina and Sarah, and that he would have never helped him if he knew what would happen. On February 4, 2021, Yasin was found guilty of harboring a fugitive and conspiring to harbor a fugitive, and he was sentenced to 12 years in federal prison. Now, Yasser's trial started on August 2nd, 2022, and prosecutors actually didn't ask for the death penalty. Yasser's defense said that the charges were only about him being Muslim and that this case was a botched investigation fixated on a Muslim man in a post 9-11 world and that Islamophobia was the reason Yasser was accused of the murders. He's saying that's the accusation, but not the insane amount of evidence pointing to him. So the term honor killing did come up at the trial, but the main motive the prosecutors argued was that Yasser was obsessed with possession and control. During the trial, Renee Hopkins, a Louisville High School history teacher, told the jury that on December 21st, 2007, Amina had emailed her telling her that she was leaving and begged for her to keep it a secret and to not tell the police. Amina said in the email that Yasser had started arranging a marriage for Amina that was supposed to happen that year. She's specifically said, okay, well, as you know, we're not allowed to date and my dad is arranging my marriage. My dad said I cannot put it off anymore and that I have to get married this year. He will, without any drama nor doubt, kill us. 
Reading that email just breaks my heart. The fact that she felt like her father was going to kill her. Someone that should have protected her, cared for her, and loved her. It's just terrible. And that she reached out to so many people letting them know that this was a fear that she had and nothing was done about it. Now, Yasser actually took the stand, which is typically rare in these kind of cases. He used an interpreter to translate for him, which is honestly pretty weird to me because Yasser speaks English. You know, we know this for a fact because even in the home videos, he's clearly speaking English. Now, Yasser claimed that he did didn't murder his daughters. He explained while he was driving, he saw someone was following them and he assumed that he was a target. So he got out of the car at the Irving Transit Center and he left the girls assuming that they would be safe. And he said the reason he thought they would be safe was because he thought his daughters had sent someone to assassinate him. Yes, him. He said, I thought if it's my daughter's friend, let them solve the problem together if they have issues. What? Like he really thought that the girls had hired someone to kill him. So Yasser told the court that he told Amina and Sarah that the car was theirs and to do whatever they want since they know how to drive. He also added that since they ended up murdered, he regrets leaving them alone. He said, if the FBI did their work, they would know, but they were looking for Yasser Saeed and they did not do what they had to do. Yasser also said he was only hiding all those years because he thought he would get an unfair trial. He admitted to detectives that yes, he was in his son's apartment in 2017 and that he did jump from the balcony of the apartment after someone came and that he landed in the gravel below. I'm assuming that's when the FBI raided the apartment and he jumped from the balcony onto the bush and that's the bush that the FBI found with the broken branches. He also told detectives that he never left the US. He also told the court that he was unhappy about the decisions that his daughters were making about their social lives. So he says that he did have problems with them but that he had nothing to do with their murders. His defense team also argued that Sarah 911 call wasn't evidence that Yasser murdered her, but said that in moments of extreme trauma, people can have hallucinations. And that's why Sarah said that her dad shot her. You've got to be kidding me. Like, really, he's saying that Sarah hallucinated and imagined her dad shooting her. So during the closing arguments, Yasser's defense attorney said, everybody has a preference in how they discipline their kids, just like they have a preference for what kind of food they eat, what kind of people they date, what religion they want to practice. Discipline does not mean you murder your children. Your culture does not mean you murdered your children. Now, Patricia also testified in the trial. She admitted that she encouraged Amina to return home even though Amina feared for her life. The prosecution asked her, did you have any inclination what would happen when the girls were returned home? And she said, part of me did, part of me didn't, I'm sorry. She said that on January 1st when Amina came home, Yasser seemed happy and he even kissed Amina on the forehead and he even shed a tear. However, after the girls were murdered and Yasser was on the run, she divorced him and she ended their marriage. Now, when she testified, on the third day of the trial, that was the first time that she had seen her ex-husband since 2008, the day that she believed that he was taking their daughters out for dinner, but instead murdered them. When she was asked to identify Yasser in the courtroom, she pointed to him and said, that devil there. Yasser's defense argued that Patricia had changed her story over the years and that she was almost a suspect in the case, but that she was probably never fully looked into because police were fixated on blaming a Muslim man rather than looking at other suspects. Islamophobia is a serious problem in the United States and around the world. But the fact that this man would use it to exonerate himself from the murder of his daughters is disgusting. Prosecutors also mentioned that Amina and Sarah claimed Yasser sexually abused them and that they had made an outcry about that. And just so everyone knows, an outcry is when someone tells a person who isn't law enforcement about a sexual assault. And there's such a thing as an outcry witness who are sometimes asked to testify. The two examiners who did Amina and Sarah's autopsies also took the stand. They said that the shot to Amina's chest is what killed her and that they found 1500 milliliters of blood which is equivalent to three water bottles in Amina's right chest cavity. They also said that Sarah was mainly shot in the abdomen. They explained that Amina and Sarah were both shot at a very close range meaning the killer was inside the taxi. A hotel employee testified about seeing Sarah and Amina in the taxi saying, I could see a young lady who had her eyes fixed open and there was stuff coming out of her nose. A crime scene investigator showed the jury the bullet riddled taxi seats and showed photos of bullet shell casings all over the taxi with one found on Amina's shoulder. Basically, he was showing the jury what a horrific and messy scene this was. A former Irving police officer testified that he believed the girls were not shot at the location they were found, meaning that they were killed and then the car 
car was moved. Amina's friend Edgar also testified. He said that while driving in a car with his father, he saw Amina and Sarah in the cab with Yasser on January 1st, the day they died. He said they briefly followed the cab out of concern, saying her look was in fear. She didn't look like she wanted to be there. Now, Patricia says that Amina did want to return, but Edgar says that's not what happened. He says that Amina did not want to come home. Sarah's boyfriend, Eric, also testified that they had to keep their relationship a secret. Otherwise, something would happen to Eric or to Sarah. There was so much testimony from both sides. The amount of evidence and statements they had to go through was overwhelming. And in the end, all Yasser wanted to prove was that he did not murder his daughters and that he was innocent. But in the end, the jury did not side with his story. On August 9th, 2022, a Dallas County jury found Yasser Saeed guilty of capital murder and the deaths of his 18-year-old daughter Amina and 17-year-old daughter Sarah. The jury only deliberated for about three hours before reaching this decision. He was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. Patricia was able to give a victim impact statement and she spoke directly to Yasser. She told him, you deserve a lot worse than what the judge gave to you. You deserve to die. At this time, you are nothing. You are a prisoner and a murderer and the devil. Yasser's public defender said that the conviction will be appealed and he said the investigation of the crime was weak and that the real killer wasn't identified. He specifically said, this is a case where there are no witnesses. There's no forensic science to it. But I'm like, Sarah literally identified her killer on the 911 call. She literally said, my dad shot me. And two other people have gone to jail for this crime, including Yasser's son who pled guilty to hiding him. Obviously, no such appeal has been won. As of now, that is all the information I have for today's video. It is such an upsetting case. These two young girls were murdered by their father in such a brutal way. The last few months of their life were filled with so much fear and with so much heartbreak. My thoughts and prayers go out to Amina and Sarah and to their family and friends. I don't know what Patricia is up to now. Like I mentioned earlier, a lot of people do blame her for what happened and feel like she needs to be held accountable, but they also see her as one of Yasser's victims. It absolutely breaks my heart that this happened to them, but so happy that their father has been caught, that he was found guilty, and that he will spend the rest of his life in prison without the possibility of parole. I hope this serves as justice to their family and friends. I know Yasser wants to overturn his conviction, but I truly hope he never gets another day in court and that he rots in prison. But all right, you guys, that is pretty much everything I have for today's video. Thank you guys so much for being here and for listening to what happened to Sarah and Amina Saeed. Don't forget to follow, rate, and review what happened wherever you get your podcast and subscribe to my channel Jackie Flores on YouTube for full video episodes. You can find me on Instagram at the Jackie Flores and on TikTok at True Crime Jackie. Let me know what other cases you would like me to cover and I will see you all in the next episode. Bye guys!